Hey everybody, my name is Jordan. Thank you so much for joining us at The Church Online. If you would like to join us for one of our live gatherings, the church meets in two locations. Our Visalia location meets at 120 South Locust Street every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And our Tulare location meets every Sunday morning at 830 South Blackstone Street at 10 a.m. We would love to have you and your family join us right here at the church. For more information on what's available for you and your family at the church, check out welcometothechurch.com. Now, let's get started with today's message. The Jewish people as a nation um, were in at this time that we're going to talk about. They were in and had been in an unbelievable turbulent season. In fact, when you look at Jewish history from the beginning of Genesis all the way through time, but especially in the season we're going to talk about here, it had, it had really, truly, there had never been a smooth sailing for them as a people, and it had never really been smooth for them as individuals. When you look at the history of the Jewish nation, at the writing of what we're going to read, they had earlier in their history, they had spent 400 years as slaves in Egypt, 400 years as a season of slaves. They had walked in the desert for 40 years. They did not cross over in the promised land, so they took another lap and did another 40 years. They had been vagabonds in the desert for a little bit more than 80 years. They finally moved into the promised land, but as they moved into the promised land, there was 12 tribes, but only a few of the tribes, a few of the tribes actually didn't even want to move into the promised land, and those that did move into the promised land, they moved in the promised land, but they did so somewhat begrudgingly, and they never actually obeyed the fullness of what God said to do. So they're, they're, they're going through turbulent times as a nation. They're going through turbulent times as individuals. They're not wanting to all the way surrender to God as people because they're not wanting to surrender to God to people. They're not surrendering to God as a nation. They finally move into the promised land. Several years later, they get their king named King Saul. That's good sometimes and sometimes kind of not good. After Saul's reign, which was very turbulent, there's a new king that's crowned named King David, and things get pretty smooth for a while. They get blessed for a while. Then King David's son takes over, named Solomon, and it's pretty good during this season. But then after Solomon's reign, the kingdom divides. It's no longer 12 tribes. There's two. There's, there, there's the country and the area of Judah, and then there's the 10 tribes of Israel. They, the nation of God has now split, and as they split... As a country divided, they now see surrounding them, as you look historically during this season, around 700 B.C., there was, a global, there was a global empire known as the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire was making their mark, and they were expanding, and they wanted their culture to expand. They, their king wanted to be the king of the world. And so wherever there was a country by him that had not yet been conquered, the king of Assyria said, you're next. And in this season, his eyes had turned towards Israel and the ten tribes. And they knew yet again we're in trouble. We tried and failed. We've tried this and we failed. This country comes, that country comes, and now Assyria is going to attack us. As a country, they had had nothing but struggle. As individuals, it was pretty much the same. There were seasons where their heart was turned towards God, but now their heart was very far from God. There were seasons where their hands were doing the things that God said to do, but now they were in a season where their hands had been turned to actual idol worship and not only not even worshiping Jehovah anymore. And there's this inside of them, there's this turbulent battle going on of who is God? Is, is this God God? Is this God God? Is this God God? Whom do I serve? How do I serve them? How do I make the gods happy? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? And they were striving and striving and striving as individuals to get something that they could not get as a nation, and that was peace. 
There was no peace in their heart because they had everything they were doing to be right with God was failing. They were in an interesting situation. And it's around this time, this peak of idolatry, this peak of adultery, this, this peak of unsettledness in their heart, this peak of Assyria is coming and getting ready to attack. It's at this very moment in Jewish history that God, through the prophet Isaiah, pins these words. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and with righteousness from now and forever on. In Isaiah 53, he writes this, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and all of us have turned to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And for the very first time as a nation... For the first time as a people, for the first time as a community of people of God, they had something that they had not had in decades, in centuries. They had hope as a nation. That yes, this is coming, this is coming, that is coming, Assyria is coming, and they're taking our children, and they're taking us away from our homeland, and they're making us be their slaves. But one day... One day he will come, and when he comes, he will establish his kingdom from that time and forevermore. And inside of the Jewish people as a nation, there was bubbling up hope. But also, for the first time as a, in a long time as individuals, they had hope that one day, one day, there would be someone come that would actually allow them to have peace with God. And they had tried, and they had tried to have peace with God, but it would never come. They would shed the blood of lambs, but the peace would not come in their heart. They would bow to an idol of gold, and the peace would not come to their heart. But the prophet Isaiah says, one day there will be one come who will be bruised, and he will be smitten, and he will be accursed, and your peace... And your iniquities will all be cast on him. And by his stripes, you'll finally be healed. And I can imagine anyway, just in my, this is just in my own, you know, Kevin kind of imagining people reading this. Being a Jewish person who knew the iniquity of my heart and the, 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 that I'm, I, I don't really even know who God is, but I want to. And also knowing that my child just got taken away from me and is living in another country in Assyria to read these words that one day the Messiah will come and not only establish his kingdom upon the earth, but he will establish his kingdom in my heart. There had to be this hope in the midst of an unbelievably dark time. But then time kept on ticking. And the Messiah did not come. And he didn't come. And he didn't come. But Babylon did. 
Babylon came and King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to set up his empire and set up his kingdom and push the Assyrians away. So Babylon and Assyria begin to battle and the ten tribes of Israel that had been taken away are in Assyria. But now Babylon comes in and says, Judah, you are mine and Jerusalem, you are mine. And King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he destroys Jerusalem. He tears down the holy temple. There's no more sacrifices to be made. He pulls them all away into exile. And then after King Nebuchadnezzar comes. Eventually the wall is rebuilt in Jerusalem. Eventually there's a remnant that comes back. They begin to live under the rule, not of a king, but a rule of, of some kings. But it was a broken system and there's prophets that are leading them, that are hearing from God. And then in 445 B.C., God speaks through Malachi, the prophet. And after the last word in Malachi is penned. God speaks no more. For 400 years of Jewish history, God was silent. He did not speak to humanity. He did not speak to his people. He was quiet. And oh, it got very dark for them. Not only was God quiet, but Alexander the Great with all of his horses and with all of his anger, was sweeping through the Middle East, through Mesopotamia, down through Assyria, into Judea and the areas of Israel, and now they all were under the reign of Alexander the Great. And as Alexander the Great set up his empire, and as, as then as it fell, General Pompey from Rome comes in, and now he establishes Roman Empire over the Jewish people. And it was a very, very dark and a very quiet time. But in the middle of all the political upheaval, in the middle of where is God now, there was a remnant of people that remembered these words. For unto us a child is born. All for unto us a son is given. He will establish his kingdom on the throne of King David from that time and forevermore. And there was a remnant of people that had, that had hope. It's interesting to me as I look through, I'm not a history buff at all, but I do enjoy looking back into pages of history. And it's interesting as we look at the story of human history, but specifically the story of the Jewish people the story of the children of Israel, it, it is a microcosm of the story of humanity. It, it really is. The story of the children of Israel is an analogy, it's a symbolism of our story. The story of the Jewish people looks a lot like your life. It looks a whole lot like mine. Our heart, our, our heart... Our, our soul, who we are, not who we are on the outside in our Instagram account and our Facebook account and bathroom selfies and, hey, how you doing? Not, not that, not the clothes, us, our heart. Our heart, our soul, like the children of Israel, has gone through seasons of living under many, many different masters. The children of Israel, they go through and it's the king of Assyria. Then, no, it's, it's, it's the Medes and the Persians. Then, no, it's Alexander the Great. Then, no, it's Rome and, Pom and General Pompey. And then, no, it's this leader and it's that leader. And time after time after time after time, the, 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 the Jewish people, their, their nation was bowing to another master and bowing to another master and bowing to another master. And isn't that a lot like our heart? That the leaders of our heart are not... Alexander the Great or King Xerxes or the Roman Emperor Trajan. But the masters that we bow to are pride. And pride sets up its kingdom in our heart. Addiction sets up its kingdom in our mind. Brokenness, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness like the Assyrians and the Egyptians 
and the Romans. Our hearts next. And they come and they set up camp. And our, our heart looks a lot like the history of the children of Israel. But not only us as individuals, our, our nation, our world, our life. I, I just turned 49 years old. I know I don't look like it. I look good for my age. But where's Joe on the drums when I need him? My 49 years of existence, when I look historically at just my time on this earth, and if we expand out to a little bit more to just go into the 20th century, just that little sliver of human history looks just like the world that the Jewish people lived in 700 B.C. In the 20th century alone, as Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini and France and England, the United States, Korea, the Middle Eastern kings and politicians and war generals have jockeyed back and forth to establish their kingdoms, they have left a wake of broken promises, ill-fated plans, political upheaval, and death upon death upon death. In the 20th century alone, over 108 million souls were lost because of war. 108 million mothers heard your son, your daughter is not coming home because this man said, my way is better than his way and his way is worse than my way. Let's fight each other and we'll decide. And then they set up their kingdom. Then there's another kingdom. Then there's another kingdom. Then there's another war and 108 million people lost their lives to war alone, not even counting the millions upon millions upon millions more that lost their life through genocide. In the 20th century alone. And at the end of all of it, what do we get? Yet another country saying, my way is the best way. Yet another politician saying, I'm going to lower taxes and increase jobs. And it just keeps going. And if we're not careful, it can seem like God has taken his hand away. Where are you, God, in my heart? Where were you, God, when that happened? Why are you being quiet? Why is this nation rising up and doing this to these innocent people? Why, God? Why are, you, why are you quiet? What, what do we do in our life? Because our life is the same as the Jewish people's history. Our heart is the same as their heart. Our country is the same as their country. Wars and rumors of wars and turbulence and addiction and brokenness. And God, are you mad at me? Are you not? What do we do? We can't fix ourselves. Humanity can't fix itself. So what do we do? We grab a hold of the hope that has already come. And we long for the hope that is coming. And I think it is, I, I think it is so important that we do both. That we as individuals, we, we grab a hold of the hope that has already come. And we as individuals in a body, we long for the hope that is coming. The first thing that we do is we long for the hope, excuse me, we celebrate the hope that is here. When it comes to our heart, when it comes to our soul, we, like the children of Israel, we, we can't save ourselves. And even though we don't buy, bow to the, to the God of an idol, we bow to the God of Amazon.com and Target.com and, and this over here and that over there. We, we bow to sporting events. We bow to birthday parties. We bow to our friends' hearts and what they want. We, we bow to so many different things in our heart, hoping that this would be the thing that brings us peace. And we can't find it anywhere except for one place. And in the middle of all of our searching, we need to remember that hope is not coming. Hope has already come. 
We are so blessed that unlike the people who lived in 700 B.C. when they heard the words that for unto us a child is born and for unto us a son is given, that was a time and distant, distant, distant future. But for us, that promise has already been fulfilled. That is a time in our distant, distant past. And we need to grab a hold of this. In your life, grab a hold of the truth and grab a hold of the hope that is already here. That one night in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord was shown around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, And this will be a sign for you, and he will be a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, with uh, with the angels, there was a multitude of angels and heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. For God so loved this world that he gave his only Son that whomsoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What do we do with our heart that seems to be unsettled is we grab a hold of the hope that is already here. Jesus has already came in the manger. He already lived a perfect life. He already died a brutal death. He already rose a majestic, uh, um, 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 coming back to life. He's here. And what we do is is we do what the Jewish people couldn't do before Christ, is we grab a hold of the hope that we have in Him, that finally, through Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, we can finally have peace with God. We no longer have to strive. We no longer have to fight. We no longer have to work. We just have to... Accept the hope that we are right with God. That's what we do. That's what we do now. And if you haven't done that, I want to encourage you to. Don't let another king and kingdom come in here. Bow to the one who was prophesied and has came already. So the first thing we do in this season that we're in is we hold on to the hope we already have. But here's the second one. I think this is something that we many times as believers that we forget to do. The second thing is, is as a nation, as a people, as humanity, as a body of Christ, is we look forward to the hope that's coming. There's a hope that we already have in Christ that's dealt with us here. But there's a hope that is coming That will not just bring hope and peace and safety and love and joy to our heart. There is a hope that is coming that will bring safety and love and peace and joy for all eternity, for all mankind, as Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom on this earth. And the days of this king and this king and this king and this king manipulating and plotting and I'll kill you and I'll change you. I'll change these walls and I'll change these laws all to maneuver themselves and to establish their kingdom. There will be a day when hope comes and everything changes and the child comes not as a child in a manger, but as a reigning king and Lord. And he sets up his kingdom once and for all. And we need to look forward to this and long for this. Romans 8 says that all of creation groans. It it groans for his coming. That there's something more than just this. There's something more to just Democrat or Republican or, 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 or independent or shopping over here or going over there or trying to pay our taxes and do this over here. No, there's hope. No more games, no more crying, no more political upheaval, just hope. And what we do right now is is we hold on to the hope that we already have in Jesus, but we long for the hope that we have when he establishes his kingdom here. Revelation says, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, I love this. For then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. 
The kingdom of Alexander the Great is gone. The kingdom of the Russia is gone. The kingdom of the United States is gone. The kingdom of Vietnam is gone. And India is gone. There is no more, for heaven and earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and He Himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or even pain. For the old order of things has passed away. All of the old order of let's set up this and let's set up that and let's fight here and let's fight there. Knock, knock, knock. Ma'am, your son has been brutally killed in war. Sir, I'm sorry to tell you, you have stage four cancer. All of that wiped away. It is no more. For he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. It is done. What is done? For there is a child born to us. There is a son that has been given. And he will establish his kingdom upon all of the earth and reign forever. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the, thir- the first and the last. To the thirsty I will give water without cost and the spring of the water of life. To those who are victorious will inherit all of this. And I will be their God. And they will be my children. What a day. That many times we, we, we totally forget and we get duped into thinking that this, that all of this, this is, this is all that there is. That I, I get right with God and I hope I go to heaven one day and man, I'll just... Heal the, no, no, no. There is something so much greater. When he, made this, when he made this prophecy that behold, a son is born and a child is given and he will establish his reign upon this earth. What he's saying is, is there will be a day coming where all of these things pass away and the God, the one God, the loving God, the hopeful God, the peaceful God, the joyful God, the triumphant God, the, the, the amazing God, the healing God, the forgiving God. He will come and make everything new and there will be no more politics. There will be no more fighting. There will be no more cancer. There will be no more tears. There will just be life. And what we do in this season of our life and what we do right now in Christmas especially is we've, listen, you don't have to, but I encourage you, I beg you, push past the sales, push past the dinners, Push past the celebratory Christmas shows. Yes, those are awesome and those are great and those are fun and they have their place. But that's not what we're celebrating. What we are celebrating today is is the hope that has already been found in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega, and the beginning and the end. And that does not stop there. At Christmas, we are celebrating. We are longing for the hope. When that same Jesus who was born in a manger comes and establishes his kingdom and we as his children live in peace for all eternity. That is Christmas. And oh, I think that's such a better story than Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Today is what we're going to do. Today, this is, this is a... Very simple one, but this is an Advent candle. And those of you who are familiar, you know that there's many different representations of what these candles can mean, but the main ones are we celebrate the Advent, the coming of the Messiah. We celebrate the hope that is found in Christ, the peace that is found in Jesus, the joy that is found in him, and the love that he is. And every week in the month of December, as we come together, we're going to talk about one of these points. And today was hope. And we're going to come together and we're going to light the hope candle. And then next week, peace, joy, love. And on Christmas Eve, we'll have the white Christ candle in the middle and we will light it 
celebrating that he came. And so today, we're going to celebrate the hope that has already come. And we're going to celebrate, maybe, and we're going to celebrate the hope that is coming. Dear Heavenly Father, as we light this candle of Advent, Lord, we celebrate you. Jesus, we celebrate the fact that you came as a child. You died and rose as a savior. And you are returning as a king. And in that, we find what our soul is looking for. In you, we find what all of the world has been fighting for for years. We find hope. In this holiday season, Lord, let us remember what we are celebrating. The hope of being right with God. The hope of of a kingdom that will not end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.